Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, anything about their past, anything that might be going on today, whatever we feel like in the moment. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the four co-hosts of the show, also known for my uh, syndicated Beatles program called Every Little Thing and my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, being joined by my three other regular co-hosts. First of all, we have the senior editor for Beatle Fan Magazine, and that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also our resident musicologist who writes for a number of different publications, including Beatle Fan, and that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also we have the writer for Beatles Examiner, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. We have a pretty interesting topic to discuss on today's show, and that is discussing Beatlesque music and artists who are influenced by the Beatles. Before we do that, I just want to make a very quick comment to our listeners, because the last show that we did, which concerned um, the influence of black artists on the Beatles, we got a tremendous response from people uh, through emails, and we just want to thank everyone who wrote to us, and uh, we want to encourage um, as many of you to write in, not only for what we're discussing on the show, but also if you have any ideas for topics that we can present here uh, on this program. So I know, Steve, you wanted to talk about one particular email that we got. Right. We got one email on our um, from Glenn Goodrich, who said, one song I didn't hear mentioned was Ain't No Sunshine on Paul's Unplugged CD, even though Hamish sang lead on the song. And... He also mentions that Bill Withers and Ringo were both inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame together. So that's a, mm-hmm. that's, that's a good, good point. Thank you, Glenn, for mentioning that. Um, and, uh, yeah. and you had, Ken, you were going to mention one. Well, as often happens, when the show is over, mm-hmm. I end up saying, why didn't I say this? But there's one, uh, to me at least, that's a glaring omission, but um, there's only one hit single that John Lennon had in his solo career that he didn't write. And that song was Stand By Me, oh. mm-hmm. which, of course, was a, a a huge hit for Benny King. Actually, it was a hit twice over when the movie Stand By Me came out. But, of course, right. Benny King, one of our great R&B singers who not only had a great solo career, but goes back to his days with the Drifters. So, right. um, yeah, that was one where I just said, how can I not say that one? Yeah, and he, <laughs> and he passed away last year, too. Just within, yeah, within the last year, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And also, I remember Julian saying that that was a real favorite of his father's, and Julian went on to perform the song live, and even there was a video made Mm -hmm. on Julian that was called Stand By Me. Mm -hmm. So, there you go. Also, uh, before we get to our topic, major news that broke today, and we're doing the show on uh, the 25th of January, about Ringo announcing dates, U.S. dates, for this year. And uh, you want to tell us more about that, Steve? The dates are all over the country. The, the tour starts June 3rd in Syracuse, New York, and ends July 2nd in Los Angeles at the Greek Theater, which he's played several, you know, many times before uh, on tour. And it's going to go all over the country. Uh, it's going to be it's it's not one of these uh, little short jaunts. It's going to be he's going to be doing a lot of stuff. Um, so uh, East Coast. South, Midwest, the, a couple of the mountain states, uh, and on on the West Coast. So if you're anywhere and you you know if you want to find out where he's going to be, um, check the story I wrote on Beatles Examiner, and um, and it's going to be the same group, which um, some people are not really really pleased with, but in my opinion, I mean they play as a unit and they play very well together as opposed to. You know, older versions of the All Stars that, you know, were Ringo and guys. This is Ringo. Ringo is one. The band is one now, and I think, mm-hmm. and that's a good. I think that's a good thing. So, I'm hoping they mm-hmm. do. They do add a couple of different. You know, make some changes and maybe even do a jam. You know, jam part in the show. That would be great. But who knows? Not up to me. <laughs> well. They've all been great lineups, but there is one very interesting aspect about this, and we'd have to do the research to look it up. But I remember hearing while um, this last tour happened, somebody actually said to me, did you, did you know that Todd Rundgren 
has performed live on stage with Ringo more than anybody else. So if you were to add up all the dates from this from this lineup, and then don't forget, he was in two other previous All-Star bands. Right. He's probably been on stage with Ringo and done more concerts than Ringo did with the Beatles. And then if you were to just take a look at this lineup, there may be more dates with this band than Ringo did with the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Which is astounding, <laughs> mm. if you think about it. That's how much he loves this band. But it's very likely that Todd Rundgren holds the record <laughs> for well, being on stage at more concerts than anybody else. This is the fourth year for the band. They've been. Yeah. They they came together and uh, you know he he pulled them together in 2012. So, and considering they have done shows, you know, all uh, or not only in the United States, but they've done them, you know, in South America. They've done them in Japan. Um, I can't recall off the top of my head if they've done England, but I th- it seems to me they have, you know. But um, you know, he, you're right. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, I, of all people, I, I wouldn't have even guessed that, that that would be the case. That Todd has played with him more than anybody else. I, that should be something that they should mention. I'm mm-hmm. that that would be that would be something that um, somebody should bring to their attention. So, well, if if it is true that I'm sure Todd knows. <laughs> Right. Mm-hmm. But anyway, let's anyway. go on to our, our topic for today, which is Beatlesque music. And way back when in the, the caveman days, when I was doing a Beatles program uh, on WDHA in New Jersey, when um, Al and also Tom Franjoan were frequent guests, um, one of the things that we did was to do a show that where we featured Beatlesque music, artists who were influenced by the Beatles. And so Al was the start of of that, really. You want to talk about that, Al? Well, matter of fact, it was uh, that goes back to an article that I did in the very early years of Beatle Fan on just that very subject, Beatlesque music. It can be now. We're not talking about tribute bands, you know. We're not talking the Fab Fo and Rain in 1964. We're talking about about records or artists who show a definite you know obviously the the influence of the beatles is is pervasive but mm-hmm. uh but there you know there are there are certain times when when you know a group or an artist will show either intentional or not a particular the overwhelming influence of the beatles you know whether mm-hmm. it's the whether it's a lead vocal, whether it's the the instrumental sound of the record, any any number of things. And again, there are uh, there are some groups whose whose sound is based on uh, who's based on the Beatles. There are others uh, existing groups who perhaps devoted one album to that type of genre if you will um so it's you know it it all falls under the kind of the umbrella of beatlesque music Mm -hmm. and also remember it all has to do with what we hear in our own ears too because we can all hear things that other people may not hear so um very much so and and not only that, one other thing that I think is very easy to overlook here, there's a lot of artists out there who I would never think were influenced by the Beatles because their music doesn't show it. But they also, they admit in conversations and in interviews that they're big Beatle fans. So sure. the Beatles influence so many people, it may not be apparent in the music. Like I was just thinking about this Ozzy Osbourne. Of all people, yeah, you know, sure. When, when, uh, if you watch the concert for New York, and he meets Paul McCartney, and he's fawning all over him, you know, he's talking mm-hmm. about how, you know, how much of a big Beatle fan he is. You'd never know it from his music, other than the music Mark Hudson produced for Ozzy Osbourne. But you know, mm-hmm. it still could be. There's so many artists out there that love the Beatles, but it may not show in their music, or it may not show that much. But why don't we go around the corner here and uh, and find out from each of you. Um, let's just say a handful, say, if you want to list five or more artists that you think were influenced, uh, in some way by the Beatles. And, and in, in some instances, I'm sure it's going to be very apparent, but why don't we start with you, Al? Okay. Um, 
the first one is is a record that was a top 20 hit in almost exactly 50 years ago in the early weeks of 1966. Uh, it's a record called Lies by a mm-hmm. group called the Knickerbockers who came from my old stopping grounds in, in northern New Jersey. Their, their lead singer, Bobby Randell, had a uncanny similarity to John Lennon's singing voice, at least not on not on every song, but certainly on Lies and, and other tracks. Uh, I believe the follow-up, uh, I think, was called One Track Mind and other tracks on their first album. It was absolutely uncanny how much he sounded like John Lennon. And, and Lies is a, is a great example of that. It's a you know a a hard rocking. Well, it was a it was a it was a rave. I think you could you could pretty much call it because yeah, of, you know. of the way they the way they did it. I mean, they basically had a wild time with it. There you go. There you go. Thanks, Steve. You're welcome. And as I said, it was a top twenty hit. Uh, the funny thing is, is that as as I mentioned, that not everything of theirs. Uh, actually had that kind of sound. Uh, For instance, the B-side of Lies is a song called The Coming Generation, which, in fact, I used to wrap up that 1965 series that I did on on Facebook and Twitter. And that has more of the sound of, say, The Association, you know, uh, Mm. if nothing else. But certainly Lies is is a great example. Of of what you might call Beatle esque music. Second one. Can I can I make is, a quick comment? Sure, please. I remember hearing that on the radio, and mm-hmm. they were definitely getting the impression that I mean, there were some disc jockeys. At least I think there was the impression that people were trying to be fooled that that was the Beatles. Um, you know, I mean, cause, well, I mean, because it sounded so much like the Beatles. But on first hearing, especially if you didn't know, oh yeah, who that was. You know, before everybody knew who it was, you know, you saw, there were there were a lot of cl- clues. I mean, they basically laid it out to do everything they could to make it sound like the Beatles. I mean, and and yeah. that was one of the first records, really. That I mean, outside of the outside of the the copycat budget label stuff, of which there was mm-hmm. tons, tons and tons sure. back in '64. That was one of the I, one of the first records I can remember that actually kind of did that. You know, that really tried to get away with that stuff. Um, it was, I mean, it's a great record, and every uh, you know when you hear it now, you kind of you know you kind of laugh at it and stuff. But yeah, back then it was it was funny to hear it uh, in the you know uh, so Beatleish. It was it was hilarious. Yeah, I mean, the instrumentation actually is probably a little more, a little harder edged than most Beatles music of at least to that point in time. But certainly Bobby Randell's vocal is, you know, a uh, is a spot on John Lennon, not imitation, but certainly, you know, that style, Mm -hmm. that that vocal style. The second one is an album that came out. In the fall of, uh, of 1970, by a singer songwriter named Emmett Rhodes. Ah, uh, I was I was going to I was going to mention him. I knew that yeah, you were going us to. probably were. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, he had been the lead singer of a band called the Merry Go Round, who themselves had definitely a Beatle a Beatle esque sound. Oh, I love, uh, love that record. Love that group. Uh, love that group a lot. Yeah, and uh, his first solo album was released on uh, ABC Dunhill in the fall of 1970, probably right around the same time as the first U.S. Elton John album. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time that I heard Somebody Made For Me, I was absolutely convinced. It's like you were just saying, Steve, about lies. I was absolutely convinced that this was either a new Paul McCartney record or maybe even possibly a new, you know, a new, a a new Beatles recording. Mm -hmm. He played all the instruments, did all Mm -hmm. of the vocals, including all the, uh, uh, the harmony vocals, similar to what Paul did with uh, uh, the McCartney album. 
and um, the album actually reached the Billboard top uh, top thirty. But it received a lot of FM airplay. This is back in the days of freeform radio, where you know they could actually play. You know the personalities could play what they wanted, and uh, it's uh, it's it's just it's a wonderful album. Uh, Ken will disagree with this, but there are some people who have said that perhaps. Perhaps that album is the the album that McCartney should have been. I never heard that before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where did you hear that? Uh, for you know, a few people back, especially back in back in my days working in Sam Goody. <laughs> uh huh. There were a couple of people who, who mentioned that. Uh, he did record two subsequent albums. Uh, that were similar in style, but not nearly as critically or uh, commercially successful. Um, I just want to say about Emmett Rhodes, that album really is is a solid album throughout. And if you listen to it, it, it's kind of like what you were saying. There's so much on there that reminds you of McCartney. And I know yeah. that that's not what he wanted to hear, because that's that's probably all he heard was that he was like a McCartney clone type person. Yeah. And anybody who was ever given like uh, a comparison to one of the Beatles or all of the Beatles, it's really the kiss of death. And, yes. um, you know, there's a few songs on there, in particular, She's Such a Beauty, which starts off with a piano part that's, you can hear Paul playing it. And even the mm -hmm. lead guitar part is very McCartney or Wings-ish. So there, there's a lot of tracks on there where melodically, it's definitely... It's something that you could hear Paul singing, and it's uh, probably the the most McCartney esque album that wasn't done by Paul McCartney. Um, yeah, yeah, and uh, it's very sad. He he actually got screwed by the by the record company, from yes. which he never really fully recovered. And he right. he has been working on new music, and I keep hearing that he either has a new album out now or it's about to come out. You haven't been hearing about that for years. But there's a lot of people who are big Beatle fans who know of Emmett Rhodes who are following him. So, um, you know, if you hear anything, I'd certainly like to know more about Emmett, you know, and, and any new music mm -hmm. that he might have coming out. Well, actually. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, Steve actually, is uh, on occasion. Steve has been giving been giving updates. Well, I mean, I talk I interviewed Emmett in 2009 um, mm -hmm. and it was the first interview he had given in a long, long time, and it was a very interesting. It was an interesting inter interview. I'm, I'm not sure if the interview is still accessible on Examiner. Um, I what I should do is, um, republish it. But yeah, he, he he was a very interesting interview, and yeah, he basically he basically did get did get screwed, and and he said, you know, those old days were a nightmare. He also went into went through some personal stuff too um and the last i heard he actually did put out something i don't have it but i understand that there have been some, there has been some new music um but i actually heard from him uh in a year or so um but um yeah he yeah i mean i, I agree that music was fantastic i think i was gonna i definitely was gonna mention him too um but I think Alan, you were going to say something too, weren't you? No, I was also going to mention him, and, and I and I have heard that he has something coming out imminently. But other than that, I don't have much to add. I mean, it's it it, it he's a very obvious choice. He he, especially his earliest stuff, really does sound like Paul McCartney of the period. And uh, so, really, you know, um, I I don't disagree with anything that was said. So, really, I've got nothing to add. The, that that mm. stuff's been, the early stuff's been reissued, by the way. It's on. Yeah. It, it's available. It's not cheap, as I recall. Uh, I mean, not, it's not, you know, outrageous cheap, but I mean, it's, it's not a, you know, a regular low priced uh, reissue. But there is some Emmett Road, so the vintage Emmett Road stuff is out there. And if you don't have it or you just have it on vinyl or something, it's well worth Oh, it's only, there's a, there's a compilation from 69 to 73 that's only 1899, which isn't bad. I mean, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's MP3s only or what, but, but yeah, and uh, Rhino did a, did a compilation years ago and, 
but yeah, I mean, there's there's some great stuff out there, and the and the the merry-go-round stuff is on CD too. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Okay, the okay. third one that I that on my list is an album by a group called the Flamin' Groovies, mm-hmm. who were. Mm-hmm who were a uh in their first incarnation they were kind of a garage band semi punk punk band but they they reformed in in 1976 and recorded an album called Shake Some Action uh that was released in June of 76 uh which was produced by uh Greg Shaw who uh, some people may remember as the publisher of Bop Magazine mm-hmm. uh, back in the 70s, and Dave Edmonds. And this was just mm-hmm. a couple of years after Dave had produced tr- tracks for the soundtrack of Stardust, which was the the sequel to That'll Be the Day, starring mm-hmm. uh, David Essex, and where he created this Beatle type group called the uh called the stray cats oddly enough uh especially since he later ended up producing the first album by the real stray cats you know the brian setzer (laughs) band Mm -hmm. but um uh but uh dave and, and and greg shaw produced this album and it was obviously very much done in the in the style of the of not just the beatles but the uh the british invasion this this was actually their fourth album but it was the first one with a kind of 60s brit pop feel to it and hmm. uh, you tore me down particularly has a um has a has a very beatlesque sound to it plus they did a cover of misery on the album. I mean, there mm-hmm. are other tracks that are, you know, that are perhaps a little bit more uh, in the vein of the Stones or other, you know, other British bands of the time. But certainly, uh, uh, Shake Some Action by the Flamin' Groovies has to go in, um, into any list of uh, Beatlesque, uh, Beatlesque music. The fourth one is, since we just mentioned Todd Rundgren a little while ago, is an album. Mm-hmm. It was actually the uh, the fifth album by his group Utopia. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was called To Face the Music. It came out, interestingly, in September of 1980. So this was at the point where the possibility of a Beatles reunion or whatever was still you know was still a uh, was still a possible and this one was definitely an intentional homage to the beatles much in the way that the ruddles was you know the 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 tracks uh were using styles of beatle music from all through their uh, their time together um the single from the uh from the album was called um I just uh I just want to touch you and mm-hmm. that was released in November of 80 and it was uh in fact that song was originally intended for the soundtrack of the of the of the movie Roadie but it was felt that it was so Beatlesque that uh that it was rejected and in fact uh, if you look on YouTube, there's a there's a video for it with uh, with the members of Utopia dressed up in you know 1964 you know matching suits and haircuts you know Todd with something approaching a Beatle haircut and very much you know with with a with video that's very much in the vein of the Ed Sullivan Show things like that. It's it's mm-hmm. definitely worth uh, worth looking uh, uh, looking up the album itself. And uh, I just wanted to say that a few years ago uh, I had the chance to interview Todd, mm-hmm. and um, I talked about that very album. And the interview is on my website. And we did mm-hmm. we talked about deface the music and um, very much what you just said, Al, how it all started with the song being in Roadie. But I I didn't get a clear answer from Todd as to whether or not you look at that album as being an homage or was it a parody? I mean, what's the difference between a tribute and a parody? Mm. 
You know, I um, mean, it's borrowing heavily. I mean, very heavily from very certain heavily. Beatles songs where yes. you can pinpoint with every song. Well, there's a song called Life Goes On, which you hear strings in there where it's just like Eleanor Rigby. You mm-hmm. know, so it's it's definitely lifted from a specific song. Uh, there's one particular song where they're borrowing from both Getting Better and Fixing a Hole. And, um, you know, you just know you can hear those those elements from certain Beatles songs. Where do you draw the line? He never really answered that question, whether it's yeah. a tribute or a parody. So well, I, I, guess you know, I, don't, just... I don't know if you put this in the same category. I guess it's the same, else, but... the, the same question would be in the directed at the Ruddles. Was that a parody right. or was it an homage? Mm. But mm. the um, the Face the Music actually got a rather lukewarm critical response, and the album only reached number 65 on, uh, on Billboard's um, uh, album chart. And the fifth one is kind of a curveball. Every once in a while, one of the boy bands will uh, will will show the influence of the Beatles. I mean, there are some people that will say that the Beatles were, you know, the original the original boy band. Of course, they were a boy band for about fifteen minutes before <laughs> before obviously, you know, their their sh- the sheer weight of their talent took away any you know any aspects of the of just being a boy band but for instance i I can remember in fact i can remember uh, when when ken and i did the that beatlesque show on ken's uh wdha show there was a there was a record by new kids on the block that was out right about that time i think it may have been hanging tough and i would have liked to have included it but there was the <laughs> Ken told me there was no way that the you know the then program director at the DHA would have allowed him to play to play a record by New Kids on the Block. But about oh, ten, it's... you about, have a good memory for these things. <laughs> yeah, but about ten years later, another very popular boy band, the Backstreet Boys recorded a song that perhaps is even more uh beatlesque it's called i want it that way uh, and in fact it, mm-hmm. it's it's one of their it's it was released in april of ni- 1999 and it reached number six uh in the u.s it was actually one of the one of their biggest uh one of their biggest hits and uh it was co-written and co-produced by max martin who is the you know who is the 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 grand high exalted mystic ruler of basically all of the you know the current pop from uh you know from you know from the Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears all the way up to Katy Perry and Taylor Swift and it has it it it, it especially the melody it has a a, a very definite uh, Beatles feel. But even though it has the 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 you know the basic sound of a you know of a of a Backstreet Boys record or of a boy band record, and I've always felt that in the hands of oh I don't know I don't know a Glenn Burtnick say, if mm-hmm. um, if you took that song, sped up the melody a little bit, you know you know you know. Uh, Took the tempo up up a notch, and added some, say, 1964 period instrumentation. You would have a great Beatlesque record. And uh, interesting, yeah, that's the the Backstreet Boys. I want it that way, and that's those are my I, five. Yeah, I've heard that record many many times, but never connected it with the Beatles. But I'll have to really? try and listen with those with those ears. Yeah. Especially listen to the lead vocal, which again seems kind of, at least to me at least, has kind of a Leninish feel to it. Uh, the sort of you know the call and response um, on the on the choruses. Uh, there's a lot of elements to it that, that at least to my ears lent you know uh, are are very are very Beatlesque. Okay. You want to mention more, or should we move on to someone else? I, why don't we move on to somebody else? All right, let's go with Alan. Okay. Um, I don't actually... 
I don't actually have five necessarily, or I have about 70. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, um, in a way, I found it hard to limit because I think an awful lot of rock is – you know, so obviously influenced by the Beatles that you could almost pick anything, including contemporaries of theirs like the Birds, you know, the mm-hmm. use of 12 string. And, you know, even though the Birds kind of moved in their own direction. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, I mean, I, I and, and also Al had, uh, you know, I, I didn't think of Emmett Rhodes and uh, he was going to be one and to face the music was going to be one. Mm. But I thought actually. Since we were talking about Todd Rundgren and since he's a favorite of Ken's as well, I I should perhaps remind our listeners that there was another Beatles connection uh, with Todd Rundgren, which is that he wrote the music for Up Against It when the New York Shakespeare Festival Mm. produced it. And uh, Up Against It was, as most people probably out there know, uh, written by Joe Wharton as the proposed third film script for the Beatles. Um, And it obviously was never done, but the New York Shakespeare Festival in 1989 decided to put on, uh, to present a version, and they brought Todd Rundgren in to do the music, largely because uh, I think the writer of the, the, the person who was arranging the script for the performance, which has changed a bit from what Orton wrote, liked to face the music and like Todd Rundgren's music in general. Although he, you know, I'm just, I, I, I did a piece about this at the time in 1989. And um, the author said that the, the Todd Rundgren album that he played for the directors was actually not to face the music, but Hermit of Mink Hollow. And then it was interesting that Todd Rundgren himself uh, did not produce particularly Beatley music for that. Uh, there is, by the way, I think the songs from that show are out on a CD in Japan. I've heard a demo of it uh, that I got at the time I, I did the interviews, and it may be that demo that's out in Japan, actually. But I, I, I just wanted yeah. to re- – can I read a quote from what Todd Rundgren said about his music for this, this mm. show? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. He says – My music for this is typical of what you might have heard on Broadway 20 years ago before Jesus Christ Superstar. I have a real distaste for the so-called rock musical. I think it devalues the craft of songwriting stage – sorry, for the craft of writing stage music. Rock is supposed to be music for the common people, which is fine in terms of satisfying a potential audience, but in rock musicals, you get not only the musical part of rock, but also the pointless spectacle as well. Andrew Lloyd Webber, to me, is the Broadway equivalent of Kiss. You have big smoke bombs, platform shoes, people dressed up as trains, and the music is unlistenable. (laughs) My major influence in theater music are Brecht and Weil, Stephen Sondheim, and Leonard Bernstein, and the reason I wanted to do it stage musical style rather than in the rock style is that theater music is what I heard when I was growing up. My father didn't like pop music. What he liked was the King and I South Pacific slaughter on 10th Avenue. As a songwriter, what I usually do is take a particular psychological characteristic I might have and drive it to a psychotic extreme so it becomes more graphic. It's no good describing something that's so subtle as to be interesting, as to be uninteresting. So so writing music for characters was not especially unusual to me. That was something I've wanted to do that was inappropriate in a pop context. So he used this Beatles-related opportunity to stretch and do something else uh, and also basically share my view of Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, <laughs> but interestingly <laughs> enough, he, he also you should admire about... You should admire Todd more now for this. I, I've always admired Todd. Um, okay. But, uh, you know, it, the, it's interesting to me as well that he talks about how when he was growing up, you know, in, in his house, listening to musicals was, you know, part of his background because it was also in a way part of the Beatles background, you know. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the music, the other Todd Rundgren music, you know, not just to face the music, but, but you know, his mm-hmm. his earlier things, too 
um, have an aspect of uh, what Candy Leonard would call Beatleness <laughs> about yeah. them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and it's interesting that, you know, in, in a certain way, it's not just because he is influenced by them, but he was also influenced by what they were influenced by. So, right. So that yeah, was kind of like the Beatles. Yeah, he he was he's so influenced by everything around him. He's very influenced by Gilbert and Sullivan. And it mm-hmm. shows a lot in his music too. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. um yeah, and you you could point to uh certain songs, especially I saw the light, very beatly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you yeah, know. Absolutely. But um when I brought all this up to him, it's almost like yeah, he's acknowledging it, but he also knows that he draws from so many different influences. He doesn't want to just come across as being, you know, a product of the Beatles, which, you know, he's a lot more than that. He's done so many different styles of music. He's he's all over the place musically. And so yeah. he kind of liked mm-hmm. the Beatles. So in that mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. So. I guess my second mention, um, I'm going to take advantage of being the second person of the four of us and uh, and glom onto Electric Light Orchestra before anyone else can do it. Sure. Um, and particularly, I would single out El Dorado. El Dorado came out at roughly around the time that John Lennon had said in his interview with Dennis Elsis, I think, that if the Beatles were together today, they would be doing what... ELO is doing. You know, he recognized the influence because El Dorado and uh, uh, other ELO stuff too is, you know, it's all sort of the son of I Am the Walrus. You know, it's not quite the, you know, gobbledygook lyrics and that kind of thing, but the string writing and the basic sound. I think I Am the Walrus is sort of the fountainhead for all of that stuff. Now, in ELO's case, obviously, you know, they, they got to that string sound from a different approach. I mean, if you go back to very early ELO, I mean, they had a, a cellist and I think a violinist in, in the ensemble, and they played a version of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and and they were sort of going for a, a semi-symphonic rock thing. But by the time you get to El Dorado, it's really sort of a different band. And um, an El Dorado is, you know, in, in a way, El Dorado is a kind of rock opera. Um, f- forgive them, Todd. Um, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, know um, but the, I, you definitely could see what, what John meant when he said that ELO is doing, uh, the Beatles would be doing what ELO is doing. I mean, th- th- there was something he liked about, their sound, their songwriting style, uh, their use of strings, that kind of thing. And um, so uh, any, uh, any, any arguments, amplifications? Well, I, no as, arguments there. As, uh, no, not, no, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm going to, I'm going to wonder though why you didn't mention the move and do you? Because that, yeah, that's true. That's true. That was really, I mean, and that obviously has you know Roy Wood and Jeff Lynn together, but that right. was also a, that was also a very Beatles song. I was sitting here, I'm sitting here compiling stuff while you guys were talking, trying not to repeat everything that everybody's already said. But that was the first thing I thought of when you said ELO was you know, and, yeah. and when you did mention that. So yeah, that's there's, true. There's true. another one. There are there and are certain fact, songs that ELO did. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that they have a a, a certain underground bootleg connection too because one of the great Beatles bootleg labels Melvin Records um, I believe the only other thing that they put out apart from Beatles and and Beatles solo things was a move bootleg so you know obviously there's a connection there Mm -hmm. well I I think um, if you were to mention the most Beatles sounding hits of all time and even album cuts you have to include some ELO songs in there to me, in particular, Telephone Line is one of the most beatle yeah. sounding songs ever. Mm-hmm. Um, can't Get Out of My Head is can't in there. Out, Turn yeah. to Stone. Oh, God. No, um, and, can't Get Out of My uh, Head, I believe, on El Dorado, so I'm covered there. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And also, um, Stepping Out, which was one mm-hmm. of the album cuts, really, is so beatle But you can point to so many of them. But um, it's not just the fact that it's the strings and you think of Walrus, but the melodies that Jeff Lynne writes are very beatle mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's it's all it's all from that that whole influence right there, and it's so ingrained in them. It's kind of like Mark Hudson, 
You know, yeah. uh, Mark Hudson and Jeff Lynn are two people that I call Beetle Babies. And, uh, uh-huh. you know, Mark Hudson wears it on his sleeve to the point where he's he's only too proud to say that he's the biggest Beatle fan in the world. And he doesn't yeah. care if any what anyone thinks. And it shows in his music. Um, Jeff Lynn, of course, you have to realize that all these artists have identities all their own anyway. But it's just sure. so strong, the Beatle influence with Jeff Lynn. And he proved to be the perfect person to work with the Beatles on the anthology. And also, he got to work with, with uh, Paul and George and Ringo, too. Right. With uh, and, and the it, solo records, too. Right. That brings up another thing, which is that around the time that, that, the, um, that Free as a Bird came out and Real Love, you heard a lot of people on Beatles chat groups really trashing Jeff Lynn, and I simply don't understand it. You know, I'm sure mate, perhaps mm. uh, our readers will write in and explain it to me. But, you know, like I, I, like Ken said, I mean, I think he's the perfect guy. He's not just glomming on to Beatles stuff. He is his own artist. He is, I think, the real thing. And, uh, you know, so I, I just never understood all of the trash talk about Jeff Lynn that, that happened around that time. I, I thought it was perfect. And obviously George did too, and mm-hmm. Paul wouldn't have gone mm. along with it if he didn't. So there you go. You know? And ELO, there, there is a there is an ELO Beatles tribute um, that's floating around called Beatles Forever. Mm. So. They also mention Hey Jude in their song Shangri La. Mm-hmm. Ah. <laughs> Little piece so my third one would be a little bit obvious, I think, even more obvious than ELO, which is the very early Bee Gees particularly New York Mind Disaster in 1941. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, like Lies, I mean, it's another record that came out and everybody thought it was the Beatles. Mm -hmm. You know, people used to say, you know, and in fact, even DJs used to talk about it on the air when they played it. And uh, and, and I remember when, I I think I mentioned once before that I had, when when we did our radio show, that I had heard an early uh, airing of a day in the life and then it was immediately pulled i remember you know telling a friend about it and he said oh that it must have been that group the Bee Gees, you heard you know <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> <it> was, <laughs> yeah. but uh it wasn't but yeah the early Bee Gees before they were um sucked into the endless vortex and you know dark spirit of disco mm-hmm. um <sighs> actually you know, first several albums had a kind of beatle charm. Mm-hmm. So, oh, yeah. Um, you always got to put a dig in there with disco, don't you? <laughs> you bet. You bet. Uh, tonight I was able to get Andrew Lloyd Webber and disco into the same discussion. <laughs> and oh, I haven't yet mentioned how much better life with the Lions is than any of that stuff. There we go. But, okay, <laughs> satisfied. Was someone going to say something else in there about uh, the just that. That the the first Bee Gees album, Bee Gees First, or the first, I guess the first worldwide Bee Gees album, mm-hmm. uh, Bee Gees First, it was mm-hmm. almost, it, it came out in, I think, August of 67, and it was almost like getting a second Sgt. Pepper that summer. Mm-hmm. It was that yeah. good, and the sound was that close to to that of the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And horizontal right. too, you know that that, that yes. sort of I, I thought upheld that promise a lot. Uh, Very too, much you know. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, even well, I have... when they did Cucumber Castle, I mean that was that was as as Sergeant Pepper as you could get. I mean that was mm-hmm. that was crazy. And and also even before uh, Mining Disaster, Spicks and Specks, which is a great song. That's a wonderful song, wonderful, and and they sound and uh, and like I I think I mentioned uh, when we were talking about doing this, they've also done you know, on YouTube. You can find a number of Beatle covers by the Bee Gees that are absolutely marvelous. But right, mm-hmm. so my one big memory of the Bee Gees, mm-hmm. and I happen to love the the whole disco period of theirs. Sorry, Alan, but um, going back to around 1971. Um, and I didn't really know too much of the early Bee Gees at that point. I was still fairly young. I remember I've got to get a message to you being played. But mm-hmm. um, I was in the Boy Scouts, and we were in Washington, D.C., and we were traveling on a bus. And I heard this record come on the radio called Lonely Days. Mm-hmm. Yep. And the first time I heard that song, I said to myself, did the Beatles reunite? Mm-hmm. Is this a Beatles yeah. song that I never heard before? And it wasn't just the fact that melodically it's so much like a Beatles song. The harmonies, of course, 
the early stuff from the Bee Gees sound so beatly because of the harmonies too. But when sure. they were singing "Good Morning, Mr. Sunshine" like that, yeah. and I was thinking of either "Rain," the song "Rain," like when the sun shines, or "A Good Day, Sunshine." It immediately made me think of the Beatles for that reason. And you know, to this day, if I had to pick, you know, the most Beatles sounding songs that weren't the Beatles, that'd have to be somewhere in my top five. Mm-hmm. I mean, "Lonely mm-hmm. Days" yeah. is is way up there. Mm-hmm. I I I got to see the Bee Gees on the one tour, um, and that was that was really uh, we went to that show basically for my wife who is a big fan and loved Robin Gibb and um, but I I I liked him too but I was overwhelmed how good that show was that was just astounding and we also got to see Barry last year and that was equally as good although obviously it would have been you know it, it, not having the group wasn't as uh, you know as good but it, it still was a wonderful show and i'm really sorry he has not apparently issued that show or, or mm-hmm. issued that tour because it was really wonderful it really really was so mm-hmm. all right okay. any others alan yeah i have a few let me see uh should it be Tears for Fears or Elvis Costello next? I'm going to go with Elvis Costello. Um, a lot of his stuff doesn't sound Beatley, and he has gone through all kinds of different influences over the years. But, you know, the Beatles have clearly been an important um, influence on him, and it comes out in a lot sure. of stuff. I think um, around the Imperial Bedroom kind of uh-huh. period and uh, King of America, you know, so I, I don't know if I can cite specific songs. I mean, I could, could probably cite a, a bunch of them, but, um, uh, you know, not to mention the, the – I guess the collaborations he did with McCartney would be sort of out of the running for by by the rules of this discussion anyway. But, you know, he is those collaborations are in some ways some of the best work both of them have done. And, you know, in that time period. So I just want to mention Elvis as as uh, a not necessarily obvious example, but someone who's you know clearly clearly very deeply influenced by the Beatles and who whose music shows it. You know, um, it's yeah. sublimated away into his own style, but it's it's really there. And I think maybe finally uh, I'll come up with I'll do one that probably most people don't know. Any of you guys know Vinny Zumo? I've heard of him, yeah. 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 Yep. Uh-huh. Um, he has an album called Swinging Guitar Sounds of Young America. came out in about 2006. Uh, very beatly. And uh, in fact, the first song on it is called Fab Gear. But, you know, there... There's a lot of Beatles influence of all periods of Beatles that comes out through his music, and he's he's definitely someone worth looking into. It's Vinny Z U M M O. Um, I know you can. I I got this on iTunes. I'm I'm not sure if it's out as a physical CD, but another guy who's you know working today, currently uh, you know up to date, but very Beatley. Mm-hmm. He's also issued uh, tribute songs for each of the four Beatles. Uh-huh. Okay. I hadn't caught up with those. Yeah, and um he also had uh, a period of time when he was in Joe Jackson's band as his guitarist. Uh-huh. So. Mm. Really? Ah. Okay. And now how about you, Steve? Well, I have a long list, but I'll have to I'll keep my comments short on all of them um because i i came up with a lot of what you guys uh, did already. I'm surprised nobody mentioned Harry Nilsson's you can't do that and without you. Uh, another one I would mention would be, since we were talking about um, Jeff Lynne and Roy Wood, um, one of my favorite Christmas songs is I Wish It Could Be Christmas Every Day. And I know that's more of a Spectre song, but I just uh, Roy Wood just was is, is great with his influence of the, the Beatles anyway, so I, I'll mention that. Um, another group would be World Party, Carl Wallinger. Mm. Um <laughs> It did a uh, cover of Happiness is a Warm Gun on Thank You World. Um, but a lot of his music is very Beatle influenced. Clatu would be another mention. And I don't, sure. I don't, I, I don't think I, I, we don't need really go, to go into the history of that. But yeah, Clatu, who actually were masqueraded or I shouldn't say masqueraded. The, the, you know, there was a, 
I don't know how to put that, but I mean, people were thinking it was the Beatles. And I never really thought it was them, um, even though there was definitely, a, you know, trying to be, they tried to be similar, but I didn't think, you know, I never really thought it was the Beatles, but that's another mention. That thing you do by the wonders, the whole thing, the wonders itself in the movie, the thing you do, that thing you do um, was definitely, you know, was definitely a, a nod to the Beatles, but that song, that thing you do was definitely a, a Beatle tribute. I'll mention, uh, I got, I, like I said, I had a whole bunch of things to mention. I'm going to mention, I'll mention three more. Um, one is the monkeys for obvious reasons. Actually, I'll mention four. I hope I'm not taking away too much from you, Ken. Um, one is the monkeys. <laughs> one is cheap trick surrender. Mm-hmm. I want you to want me and dream police sure. are, are Beatle covers. Here's one, Ken. I'm not sure if you've heard of this guy, Phil Keege. You know who Phil Keege is? Sure, I have. Mm-hmm. Yep. Sure. Phil Keege. Who, very, very McCart- very McCartney esque. Right. Yeah. And actually, they played. They they did something together. I it's been a long time, and I don't have the details on it. But they did do something together, or they were they met. I, I don't know. I, I know that they've been in contact with each other, and McCartney knows about him, and he knows about McCartney. And the last thing I was going to mention was uh, actually there were two, but I'll mention just one. Is have you heard the word by the foot, F U T, which was actually Maurice Gibb of the Bee Gees getting back to the Bee Gees again, and um, it was bootlegged as by the Beatles on several vinyl discs you know right. back way back mm-hmm. then. and and apparently according to one thing i read today online yoko tried to copyright that song no i hadn't heard that but apparently she thought it was a john song um which i think is is hilarious um but anyway hmm. uh, yeah i don't know if that's true but that's funny but anyway there you go that's my quick my quick uh dash through there I had others too, okay. but I had others too. Maybe if we have a few minutes, I'll go through the, I'll quickly mention the others, but uh, that's it. Go. Oh, just, there's so many of them. The best thing about this is that it'll come, you'll, you'll mention something that I hadn't thought about for quite a while, but I had to put ELO at the top of the list just because so many of their songs are beatle And like I said before, Jeff Lynn, the way he writes, the style that he writes in, not that every song is, but sometimes there's a melody there that you could definitely hear John or Paul sing in particular, or maybe George. I don't know. But uh, there's so many ELO songs that fall into that category. I had to put the Raspberries in there. The Raspberries really were a combination to me of of the Beatles, the Beach Boys, and the Who all combined. I think Eric Carmen said that. And, um, you know, you take songs like Go All the Way, where you have that call and answer thing, which the Beatles borrowed from the girl groups, like we were discussing before. Same thing with I Want to Be With You. Um, several years ago, when the Raspberries reunited, they actually did two different uh, tours. But the first time they reunited, I had the chance to, to interview Eric Carmen. And one of the things that I will always remember and treasure about that interview is that I had a chance to say to him, because Let's Pretend is one of my favorite songs that are non Beatles yeah. songs. I said, it's the greatest Beatles song they never wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really it's it's a combination of Paul McCartney and Brian Wilson combined what that would sound like. Yeah. Yeah. So let's pretend is is way up there as far as great, you know, Beatles songs. There's a whole bunch of other songs in the Raspberries catalog. There's one called um If You Change Your Mind which wasn't a hit, very McCartney-esque. Um I hear McCartney in a lot of uh well Eric Carmen's music in particular all by myself. Oh, Never yeah. going to fall in love again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Great Expectations, which was on the first solo Eric Carmen album. Moving on, yeah, I had to say Emmett Rhodes, definitely. Um, Billy Joel. Billy Joel is someone who's had an amazing mm-hmm. catalog, and he's one of the greatest songwriters to me. There are times when there are certain songs that are very beatle Now, I know in particular we're going to bring up the Nylon Curtain, which is right. the one album that you point to because there are certain songs there where where it was just blatant. (laughs) In particular, the song Laura. Laura is a song that, uh, if you never heard it before, go on YouTube, listen to it. It's kind of like a mixture of Sexy Sadie with um, Hey Jude. It's got that 1968 Beatles feel to it, kind of a a Lennon bitter song. And uh, it just, it's so perfect. Everything about it, the drumming, the guitar solo in there is very George. There's a song on that album called Where's the Orchestra, which is very McCartney-esque. There is one called Surprises, which is very 
kind of, I can't tell if it's more John or, or like Paul, but in particular throughout Billy's career, there are times when melodically I can hear Paul singing the melody. Um, maybe not hear Paul sing Billy's lyrics, but the melody seems like something that Paul would sing. Don't ask me why. It's kind of like a sped up and I love her mm -hmm. to me. There's a song called Through the Long Night, which is on his Glass, Glass Houses album, and it's got piano and a French horn. So what do you think immediately <laughs> when you've got that combination? So I immediately think of For No One when I hear that. You know, it's just the melodies that, that Billy Joel comes up with just sound like something that has a strong McCartney presence to me mm -hmm. in a lot of his music. Um, also, you got to mention Mark Hudson, the Hudson Brothers. I mean, come on. Like I said, it's written on, on his sleeve. Just listen to So You Are a Star from the Hudson Brothers, and that's one of the, the most beatle sounding singles ever. Um, you did mention Harry Nilsson. So much of Harry Nilsson's music, you can tell, very heavily influenced by the Beatles. Mm -hmm. um, you got you to gotta say Squeeze. Squeeze is a band that, you know, there's a lot of songs there that, that remind you of the Beatles. And Different and Tilbrook often are referred to as Lennon McCartney. And I think they're kind of tired of hearing about it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in particular, when I was in college and I was on the radio there, Argy Bargy was a big album yeah. when it came out. And the song, If I Didn't Love You, my God, if that isn't a beatle song, I don't know what isn't. I think if the Beatles were around in 1980, they would have a song like that. And there's also um, Another Nail in My Heart is, an, is a, a song from Squeeze that I could hear being very beatle there's a band that I remember only because this goes back to my days in New Jersey radio and WDHA when I solicited fans to send tapes in. There was a band, very obscure band, called Sleepy Hollow. And um, I think they came out of New York. If you Google them, you won't find anything about them. There's a, there's a heavy metal band called Sleepy Hollow. That ain't them. This is a band that uh, put out this one album, got a lot of beatle songs on it, in particular sounding very much like John. Songs that you could hear John sing, one called Take Me Back, which is, God, if, if you heard it right now, straight out of the Beatles songbook. XTC, you got to put in there. There's a lot of songs from XTC yep. that I hear being contemporary Beatles, very off-center, kind of quirky. The stuff that Andy Partridge writes, I kind of feel like uh, it, it's like where Glass Onion would lead you to, <laughs> if uh -huh. that makes any sense. There's there's melodies that XTC comes with comes out with where it, they're not typical melodies, but they kind of make sense. They go in a different direction. They're kind of quirky, but, you know, I can just hear, like, John do that kind of stuff. One of my favorite bands today is Keen, and uh, yes. some of their songs definitely sound Beatlesque. Certainly, uh, there's a song on their Hopes and Fears album. You can all Google this. Called Everybody's Changing. Listen to that and tell me that's not a beatle sounding song. Mm -hmm. Or Somewhere Only We Know, which was the biggest hit they had here in the States. Uh, Keen, very uh, keyboard-heavy band, kind of like Coldplay. Um, Cheap Trick, you have to mention. Um, Voices is one of the most beatle sounding songs I think they ever did. Oasis, you know, I'm not a big Oasis <laughs> fan, but you can tell a lot of, a lot of their stuff is very derivative. Uh, Jellyfish was a band that oh, came yeah. out back in... Uh, the late 80s and uh, through mid-90s, I think it was. They didn't put out much music, but a lot of it's very beatle -y. And in fact, um, two of the guys from the band, Andy Sturmer and Roger Manning, they got to record with Ringo because they're on um, I Don't Believe You, which is on Time Takes Time. They wrote the song and they play on it. Okay. Anyway, so you want to add more, Steve? Yeah, just mention three very quick things. The Sponge Tones. Are are another uh, another band? If you look up their stuff on YouTube, they uh, did um, Needles and Pins, which also brings to mind the Searchers, who I think were very unintentionally Beatles sounding. But I mean, there a lot of their uh, Needles and Pins, especially, was was a Beatles sounding song. Uh, I think. But the one thing, the one one more song that I wanted to add. What may or may not be by the Beatles, it's called Peace of Mind, The Candle Burns, that everybody... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, I'd love to know, we, I'd love to get that mystery settled as, as to whether that's really them or not. I mean, you know, I, I don't think it is, but it's it's a great song. I, I, it's It's grown, let's put it this way, I feel a lot better about it than I did back in, you know, back in the 70s when I first heard it on bootleg vinyl, and but... Uh, 
the endless mystery is is that is it the Beatles? Nobody ever nobody says nobody's come out and said no. At least didn't uh, somebody ask Paul about that? I believe at one time. I, I believe there was actually there was actually uh, at one of the press conferences way back in the in the eighties. Uh, I think somebody asked him, but um, who knows? I, and I think he couldn't remember. Um, which, which uh, you know, prolongs the the mystery. But there you go. There's there's there were the other things I was going to bring up. Alan uh, nearly mentioned this, nearly included in, in his list. Tears for Fears. I assume right. you're thinking sowing the seeds of love. Sure. Yeah, yeah particularly that. Yeah. And and I remember at the time that came out when uh, there was a, a Paul McCartney press conference where someone said that they said they were influenced by the Beatles. And he said, well, I mean, they'd have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, there's so much, you know, you know I mean, everybody was influenced by the Beatles in some way or another, you know, since 1963. So mm-hmm. sure. I'm surprised we came up as many with as many as we did, but I mean, we could have kept, oh, going. we could have kept going. I mean, you know, yeah. I mentioned jellyfish before. Uh, there was a guitarist in the band, Jason Faulkner who actually ended up playing on several tracks on the Chaos and Creation, the Backyard Sessions for Paul. And I don't know, we, before we uh, came up with the idea of doing this, we were debating whether or not to include Badfinger, only because right. of the Beatle connection there. And right. I just happened to feel that even if they didn't record Come and Get It, even if George Harrison didn't produce four of the songs on Straight Up, they still are very Beatley. And oh, just the way that... You know, the, the fact that it's a quartet, you know, you got a bass player, lead guitarist, rhythm guitarist, and drummer. All of them wrote music. Even Mike mm-hmm. Gibbons, you know, wrote music and even sang a couple of songs in Badfinger. And you can always make the comparison that Pete Ham was the McCartney and Tom Evans was the Lennon and Joey Mollen was the George Harrison of the group. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you if you listen to their music, and they had this wide variety of styles and... uh you know, great songs with great melodies and great harmonies. You know, it's very easy to make a comparison between the two of them and see the similarities there. Obviously, they were influenced by the Beatles, but they also had their own identity, too. Mm-hmm. Well, very much so. Yeah. And, pe- and people should be aware we did not mention, we purposely did not mention the Ruddles because of the obvious, you know, we weren't, right. trying, we weren't trying for parodies. We were trying for real, real stuff, so... Well, mm-hmm. again, it was like we were talking before. We, you know, you know, is it is it a parody or is it a you know an, an homage? You know, in the case of both the Ruddles and the face of music. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think a, that there's a it's a fine line. I think, yeah, I think there's a huge difference when you create music that's completely original melodies and lyrics, and it's Beatlesque as opposed to right. really taking directly from songs where it's so apparent. You know, and that's where you, you, that's the difference between the Ruddles and, and the Utopia album to face the music. Because you listen to Utopia and, and every time you hear a song there, you'll say, oh, that sounds like a certain song. Whether it's doesn't matter what you pick, eight days a week, Eleanor Rigby, you're going to say, oh, that reminds me of that song in particular. Right. Whereas you can take an ELO song, you can take Turn to Stone and it's mm-hmm. Beatlesque, but it doesn't sound like a specific Beatle song. Right. Mm-hmm. Very so. true. Very true. And you know, since you mentioned Keen, uh, also mm-hmm. you might uh, mention the Paley Brothers, who did an album on, I think it was on Sire, uh, during the, you know, I guess we, what you would call the skinny tie band period, you know, the, <laughs> around, the, time of the around the time of the Knack. And the uh-huh. you know and the records and the, those kind of power pop bands, and mm-hmm. their their sound was was also very you know definitely uh, Beatles influenced and uh, they're, they're Keen uh, has a, a definite similarity in their in their sound to the Paley Brothers. Okay, I'll, I and will it, try to check them out. Yeah, because I don't like know Andy, the Paley Brothers. Oh, okay. In fact, Andy Paley later on worked with Brian Wilson, right? Hmm. Particularly on his first, uh, I guess his, I guess you would call his first solo album. The album that came out, I think, in '89, if I remember correctly. Okay. Well, we certainly covered a lot of artists here in this show, and no doubt 
I'm sure many of our listeners are are thinking right now, but you didn't say this artist. <laughs> right. Or you didn't say that artist. So by all means, write to us because we'd love to hear uh, what you think about this particular topic and, and uh, what we covered here. And, um, you know, enlighten us because I'm sure it's so easy to overlook certain artists because this is such a wide topic here. There's so many artists that were influenced by the Beatles in a number of ways. And um, so we all just want to keep learning about this. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that brings this show to a close. This has been a great topic. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can write to us at our email address at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. And by all means, keep the emails going. We love getting feedback from you folks. And you can also get in, t- in contact with us on our Facebook page as well. And on our Twitter account, which is what, Steve? Things We Said Fab with the with the little Twitter sign in front. So Things We Said Fab. All right. So for Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, Al Sussman, and myself, Ken Michaels, thanks so much for listening to Things We Said Today. And we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.